Well, it's so great uh, to be with you all. I'm going to kind of give a little bit more detailed introduction uh, with regards to the talk about who I am and where I'm from. As, as it says, I, I, I didn't have to come far for the conference. I live about 55 minutes away in Pittsburgh. I'm the director of evangelization for a big Catholic parish there. I'm also the young adult coordinator for the National Service Committee for the Catholic Charismatic Renewal, and then I do a lot of speaking and traveling and, and not a lot of sleeping. Okay, not a lot of sleeping, unfortunately. Uh, just about my personal life, I've I'm, I'm been married nine years in August. I have four children and one on the way. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We're very excited. My wife has the most horrible pregnancies. She has this horrible condition called HG. And uh, she's like in and out of the hospital constantly because she's just constantly throwing up. And, and uh, so we're praying for twins, two for one pop, right? Two for one pop there, okay? So I want to you know, keep extending it. And when, when I heard Ralph speak this morning, all I could think was like, we got to have more kids, you know. We got we to gotta turn the tides here, right? We got to turn the tides here and make sure that we were raising up an army like that. So what we're talking about is, is the inner room, right, uh, going deeper in both our personal prayer and in prayer ministry. And what is the link between those two things? And I just want to kind of point out a few things. First of all, I've been in parish ministry um, full-time parish ministry, this will be my fifth year now, and, uh, and in full-time parish ministry, right, immediately uh, you have a different demographic, okay? I spent time speaking at things like this and doing parish missions and talks and youth ministry talks and things like that, and that is a whole different group of people, okay, that, that, that you come in contact with than when you're doing parish ministry, right? The kind of person who comes out to a parish mission on a Tuesday night when there's a football game on is markedly different than the rest of our brothers and sisters who may not be in that place, okay? And so right away, I was exposed to kind of a, a, a different side of, of, of the church and even just the culture at large that I wasn't expecting. And, uh, and I knew right away, you know, that uh, it's gonna be really important, right? In, in the culture that we live in um, and, and the culture that I'm working in and that we are all working in, in this vineyard, we need to go deeper, right? Because, uh, Secularism is more deeply embedded in our culture. Uh, Satan is getting deeper into our culture, right? And so we need to go deeper, draw down, so that we have the, uh, the means to respond to this. And the, the second thing I noticed right away is that, uh, in, I, I don't know if it's true for other places, but in America, right, uh, I mean, just every year that I'm working in ministry with people, they're coming more deeply wounded. They're coming more deeply wounded, right? And, and uh, we, we have a culture that lends itself to uh, small wounds never getting healed, right? And just festering and growing and growing and growing. And so I found myself kind of at a loss, right? Uh, how can I help these people, you know? Uh, it's, just, it's just not enough, right? Uh, it's awesome uh, to pray with people at a conference like this, um, but it's nothing like praying with someone uh, who has never experienced anything like this, right? They come in a lot more wounded, uh, a lot, a lot uh, slower and kind of atrophying, right? Compared to people who are energized and things like that. So it's really important that as we move forward as a, as, as a church, that we learn how to go real deep in prayer and how to draw deeply uh, from that well and, and, and then to apply that to our, our prayer ministry, okay? So I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is talk about personal prayer and tell you a little bit about my prayer life and then I'm gonna apply that to prayer ministry. We're gonna talk about some practical tips both for personal prayer and prayer ministry and then we'll have a time for questions and answers if you wanna try. I'll do my best to answer them. And there's some people in the audience who I might just say, hey, could you just answer this question for this? Cause I, I'm not, it's not my thing. Uh, so I always tell this story when I talk about prayer, okay? That I kinda of give my, my testimony of prayer what has happened in my life, okay? Uh, I don't know if I mentioned this before, I'm the youngest of 10 children, okay? So if my brothers and sisters were here, they'd tell you I'm the most spoiled person on the planet, okay? Now, I don't think that's true, but there's nine of them to out, you know, outvote me, so I never win that argument. But uh, to be honest with you, I, I lived a very, I don't know, you call it lucky, blessed, whatever you want. I, I didn't have a lot of problems, okay? Uh, you know, by the time I was growing up, my, my parents were pretty well off, you know, I never really struggled with anything, it wasn't anything bad in my life, and I was always like kind of considered like a lucky person, and people would even say that to me, like, oh, you're so lucky, you know, Think, oh, good things always happen to you, and it was pretty much true, I mean, I never, 
really experience anything that, you know, no hardship, okay? And uh, even to the point, like, as we were growing up, right, when I was in sixth grade, you know, what we used to do is we'd, like, like, ride our bikes up to the gas station, and, you know, at that time, like, they had, like, if you bought a Coke, like, you could open up the cap, and it would say, you win, like, a free candy bar, or something like that, right? And it was literally, like, uh, to the point where my friends would be like, will you buy mine? Because I would win all the time, all the time. And, like, on the way to, sc on the way to school, we would carpool. I would regularly just be looking out the window and just find money. And I'd be like, stop the car. There's a $20 bill, you know. I jump. Really, this happened to me a lot. I'm serious. I'm serious. In, in high school, okay, I started to play high school sports. And I, I, w I was the captain of every team I ever played for. And I am a horrendous athlete. I mean, honestly, if you saw me throw a football, you'd be like, did you go to school for the blind? Or what, you know, what, how were you the captain? I don't understand. You know, and so... It, things like that always just worked out, even with grades, okay? I remember coming home, right, and, and my dad saying, you know, Dave, if you, tried for, if you tried for A's and you got B's, we would be, it would be okay. And then my dad would leave the room and my mom would say, try for C's and have a great time, right? Uh, so it was like never, you know, it was real easy. And uh, so I was like, okay, sounds good to me, right? Uh, then when I went to college, my first week of college, it just continued, you know, never really tried real hard, and I was here, I was in the cafeteria, my best friend the first week of college said, uh, who do you think the most beautiful girl on campus is? And I said, that girl over there. Five years later, I married her, right, okay? <laughs> Things always worked out just the way it was. I graduated from college, and I wanted to stay here, and I wanted to work here, and uh, there was a job in development, and they wanted 10 years experience, Okay. And I was like, well, I'm Dave Van Vickle, so who cares? Ten years means nothing, right? I get, I get what I want, you know? And honestly, I, you know, you wouldn't want to met, meet me at that time, right? Uh, but that's the way I was, right? And, and I applied, boom, I got the job, right? They were like, well, you, did, you know, your whole family went here. You're a perfect candidate. We might as well just, we'll just train you. I was like, okay, yeah, that's, what, that's what's supposed to happen to me, right? And, uh, you know, it just always happened. Even... Even in ministry, right, pe people would always say, my mom would always say, like, you know, Dave, you have an anointing. Like, you don't realize, you don't understand what it is, but there's an anointing that goes with you. And I'd say, well, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, I'm just lucky, you know. Or probably at that time I thought, I just work hard, right, which is not true. <laughs> Continued as we got married. Uh, we were living in Burlington, Vermont. Has anybody been to Burlington? Is anybody from Burlington here? Anybody from? Okay, so I'm going to make fun of Burlington a little bit. All right. Uh, Burlington, Vermont is awesome. I love it there, but it's like the hippie capital of the world, okay? And we just like loved it. I mean, everybody there is like trying to live the authentic life, you know? And it's like everyone's got like water bottles hanging from their belt, like from a carabiner, right? Or if you're like really authentic, you just have a string with like an old peanut butter jar, okay? And, 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 and you know, marriage, our first year of marriage, it was just like bliss, right? And it was awesome. And, and we got pregnant right away with my oldest son, Sam, who's seven now. And Sam, I mean, he was sleeping through the night at like four weeks, okay? He never cried. We took him everywhere to restaurants and everything. He never cried. I would say to nurses, is, is there something wrong with him? And they'd say, just thank God, you know. No, everything's fine. I mean, it just continued this way, really, in all honesty. And it just continued that way for a long time. And, and my prayer life throughout this whole time, right, I had a pretty radical conversion when I was 14 years old at a Steubenville conference, right? with Father Dave Pavanka, and, uh, and uh, at that time, I started a daily prayer life, but my prayer life reflected what my life was like. It was basically like I was a cheerleader, like, yeah, God, keep it going, right? Like, you're doing a good job, you know? Keep it up. Or, in, in, in sometimes it was like superstitious, like, well, I got to keep praying to keep the gravy train coming, you know? I got to keep praying, you know? And it really was very much like that, you know? I just kind of it, it, you know, if I needed something, I might pray for it, but it really I just expected it and then patted God on the back, like, you're doing a good job. Everything's good, just, just so you know. You know, I want to let you know. And then uh, my wife and I moved from Burlington to Buffalo, New York, which if you don't like snow, that's my first mistake, okay? And I don't like snow, okay? But we, but we moved there, and we loved it. We loved, Bur we loved Buffalo, too. Uh, but we, we uh, found out we were expecting our second child. His name is Max, okay? And uh, everything was going well. Everything was great. My wife looks like, you know, she's beautiful. I mean, if you saw her, you'd be like, what? Are you kidding? How did that happen? Okay, she's beautiful. 
okay? On, on a regular basis, people ask me about this, right? So I'm, I'm used to it now. Even my mom's like, what? You know, like, what, you know, she, she, she need glasses or what? You know, uh, but we just continued. So when my wife was pregnant, she, she, she had another really tough pregnancy. And two months early, she went into labor, okay? And, uh, and, and she had Max real fast. And I remember, you know, in my mind, it was like, well, nothing bad ever happens to me, you know. So I remember saying, like, he was four pounds. And I remember saying to the doctor, when can we take him home? And the doctor was like, he's going to be in the NICU, you know, for a long time. I was like, what? You know, that's weird, you know. And a, a month went by, and on the, uh, it was in September, I think, on the Feast of Our Lady of Sorrows, the hospital called, and, uh, and they said, we need you to come in, right? And, and you know, I, nothing in my mind could have thought, you know, that there was going to be anything wrong or anything like that. And uh, we, we were driving to the hospital, just thought maybe we had to fill out some paperwork or something like that, right? And it turns out they had done a one-month head ultrasound on Max, and they found substantial brain damage. And uh, it was kind of a surreal experience, right? Still, I mean, still, you know, I'm still have a hard time talking about, but it was a surreal experience because, you know, the doctor was saying things that were so foreign to me, right, like crutches and wheelchairs and cerebral palsy and, and, and severe, you know, uh, disability and things like this, and, uh, and it was like if ever two trains were on the same track, right, that we just collided, right, God and I, or life and I collided, and at this time, I was working for a Catholic radio station up in Buffalo, and they had a chapel at work, and, and I don't know why I was doing this, why I was so motivated, but at this time, I was going into work, like I was waking up at four, and I'd be at work at five for a holy hour, okay? And I would pray, and then at six, I'd start work. I've never been that motivated, so don't think that I'm like that now, okay? But, but I would, okay? And, uh, I remember when we found out about Max, I was like, just kind of dumbfounded. I, you know, I, I didn't really know how to respond. I didn't know what was going on. But I remember the next morning I went in to work and I sat down in the chapel and I remember I looked right at the crucifix and I said to the tabernacle, I said, I don't know what happened yesterday, but you better tell me and, and I'm just gonna wait. I'm gonna wait. And I just sat there and I didn't say a word, and I was angry, and I was sad, and I was angry, and I had all these visions of, you know, my son in a wheelchair and not being able to do things and all these things, right? And, and it just filled, filled my heart, and I just sat and I said, I'd like to know what is going on here, because this isn't supposed to happen to me. This is not what my life has been like. I was not prepared for this at all, and, and why, why is it happening now? And I sat there and, and nothing really happened. And days went by and nothing really happened. And weeks went by and every morning I come and say, I'm still waiting. I don't think I'm gonna budge, okay God, because I'm, I'm waiting for an answer here. And after about three months, the, it was kind of the strangest thing happened where all of a sudden I realized, right, that just very quietly, quieter than words, right? All along, God had been speaking to me since I sat there and said that to him. And, and, and it was like all of a sudden I realized that I had a lot of peace, right? You have to imagine those three months were filled with doctors and terrible prognosis and all these things. And, and every time we'd pray and say, you know, oh, maybe we'll get a, you know, maybe a miracle is going to happen and, 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 and nothing would happen. And, and, uh, and all along, right, during these times, I, I, I realized that God was just speaking to me tenderly and quietly. And at the end of these three months, I, I had this incredible peace, right? And I knew that God was speaking to me and I could kind of just sit in and listen and that God was talking to me deeply and truly. And it was like the best thing that ever happened to me because it was kind of like, in my mind, right, that God said, like, oh, I've been waiting for you to shut up in prayer, right? How many of us feel like that, right? Like, you know, we just, like, unload on God, right? And then you're like, okay, time's up, God, so if you could just take care of those things, right, I got to go do, deal with everyday life. 
but it was like something enough for me to be quiet. And all of a sudden I realized what real prayer was. That God, the king of the universe, desires to speak to our hearts. Right? And, and, and it wasn't like I was sitting there writing down messages from God, like, okay, okay. You know, it wasn't like that. It was deeper than that. And it was much more profound than that and much more intimate. Right? A message from God uh, it is, is not, it doesn't compare to what I was experiencing. And I realized that my prayer life at that time w- was so immature before this happened to me because I was never giving time to listen, right? Somebody asked St. Teresa of Avila, this is like a famous quote of hers, you probably heard it. Uh, they said, why doesn't God speak to people anymore like he did in the old times? And she responded famously, it's because in the old times it was speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And now it's, listen, Lord, your servant is speaking, right? And, and how many times are we caught in that, right? So often, so often are we caught in that. And that's where I was caught in. And it was, it was I, I don't know what the reason was for, for, for my son Max's disability, but that was enough. I mean, me being brought to intimacy with God and what he's done in my family w- was enough for me to find some reason in this and to realize that I needed to shut up and start listening to God. And, and immediately a few things changed. Number one, the ministry that I was engaging in got a whole lot more effective and a whole lot deeper, okay? I think w- one of the things that happens to, to a lot of us, and you can kind of you know, agree with me or not agree with me, but so many of us who were baptized in the Holy Spirit or had the Lord touch our life, right? It's, it's almost like God takes us for a period of time and puts us at the heights of sanctity. And everything we do, God blesses, right? We're, we're, we're ministering to people. We're having insights that, that things happen. And, and I think for a lot of us, we kind of feel a gradual pulling back of that as time goes on. And I think what God does is he kind of puts us in that position and he says, this is where you need to go. Let me show you. And then pulls us back and says, now you need to go that path the right way. And so I think like, our ministry, very often it flows, right, from, from Jesus Christ present within us, the Trinity present within us. But the deeper the well is, uh, the, the more we're able to access, right? The more we're able to access and the more we're in tune with what God's doing. And so as I deepen my personal prayer life, it deepened my, my ministry because I was able to kind of access that, that deeper well that was opening up inside me. So I'm gonna give you just a few pr- practical tips of what helped me deepen my personal prayer life, okay? And these are gonna be strange and, and they're gonna be people, all kinds of people who would disagree with me, okay? And probably people who are a lot smarter than me. So maybe temper this with some other books you've read or something, right? But this is what's worked for me, okay? Number one, and this is, this is weird, I'm sure, for a lot of you, okay? Keep your prayer life somewhat a secret, okay? Keep your prayer life somewhat a secret, okay? Now, this seems strange because I'm giving a talk to you about prayer, about my prayer life, right? So I'm violating my own rule, but it's for the good of the conference, right? Okay. Uh, Here's why I'm saying that, okay? I have a friend, okay, who shall remain nameless, but I'm going to pick on him a little bit, who uh, will, anytime he does something nice for his wife, it's like he's like, he wants to tell everyone else about it besides his wife. Do you know these people? We all know them, right? Okay. We don't have to say who they are, all right? You don't need to agree on it, but we all know these people, right? And, and it's like, you know, the, he buys his wife flowers. It's like, you see those flowers I got for my wife? Nice, huh? You know, right? In a lot, a lot of ways, I think we can become like that in our prayer life, where our prayer life comes, becomes very much like, who can I tell about the latest prayer experience I've had, Right? And I'm not saying it's always bad. In fact, sometimes it's really good to share people with how, what God is doing in your life. But sometimes keeping it a secret, right, deepens the relationship a little bit, right? And it takes any kind of motivation, outward motivation out of it. And so that your motivation is just, I want to go deeper with you, God. You're the one I want to love. I don't need anyone else to see that I'm loving you. I just want to be here and love you, okay? So just number one, keep it a secret, okay? Okay. Maybe even just more of a secret, okay? Maybe even just more of a secret. Some of you must be in faith sharing groups and things like that, and you got to talk about it, but more of a secret. It's one of those things that 
people get frustrated by because they'll ask me questions about my prayer life in particular. And I'm like, well, I'll answer general questions, but I don't really, really love talking about what it's like right now because I'm a prideful person, okay? Father Dave just told me five minutes ago that I'm always dying to get a microphone in my hand, so I don't know where that came from, but I am a prideful person, okay? And, uh, and, and the truth is, is that uh, I keep that a secret because it helps me, right? It's kind of like a, a, a playpen I've got around myself, right, so I don't get into trouble. Okay, number two, I had a friend in college who, who speaks at the conferences. He's awesome, okay? And uh, this is what would happen in college, right? Everybody, we would all go out at night and, you, you know, go out to wherever. At this time, it was called, a place called Cross Creek Tavern, which is the scariest, dirtiest bar I've ever seen in my life, right? It's in Mingo Junction, West Virginia, and it's like out in the woods, and it's a miracle that you even get there, you know, during the day, let alone at night, right, after your friend's been drinking or whatever, right? But we would always come home, and, and my friend Brian, would, he would almost always, I would always be impressed with him because he would say, it would be like 3 in the morning, and he'd say, we'd be like, okay, we're going to bed. And he'd be like, oh, I haven't had my prayer time yet. I'm going to go have my prayer time. And I'd always be like, man, I wish I was disciplined like that, you know. I wish really badly that I was disciplined like that. And I would kind of be jealous. Now, I've, I've kind of evolved, and here's why. I think picking a prayer time is really, really important to God, okay? And marriage has taught me a lot about this. Here's why. Right? In marriage, right, if I were to say to my wife, honey, we are going to talk today, I promise you. I got a lot of things to do, so I'll see when I can fit you in, but we're going to talk today, don't you worry, okay? What do you think she would say? It would not be pretty, let me tell you, it would not be pretty, okay? And so I think very often this is the same with prayer. Like when we pick a time and we stick to it and we keep it, right, uh, that that is our special time with God, right? And I think God really anoints that time, really anoints that time, okay? Number three, uh, there's a book from uh, Mother Nadine. Anybody have Mother Nadine books? It used to be around all the time. But one of the th one, a really great piece of wisdom that she shared was this, okay? Most of the saints say it, it, it would be crazy to tell someone to just start a life of silent prayer. In fact, sometimes it could be dangerous, Right? Because it's very difficult, right? A life of silent prayer is not easy. It's something you have to grow into. It's something that you have to work towards and, and, and kind of let God mold you right into this. So what, what, what you have to do is you have to start a little bit like training your mind to be more and more silent. And so what Mother Nadine said is, you know, how do, how do we listen to God? Well, what she says is like, look, let, what we do is practice active listening. Meaning that we don't just sit there, right? And I tried this before, right, with an egg timer, right? Okay, I'm going to be silent for 10 minutes, okay? And you sit it, and, and what happens, the first thing, you, you know, your first thought is like something, you know, that's going on in your life or something like that. Well, what Mother Nadine said is like this, right? Maybe take a scripture verse and look at it, but, but more than that, ask God questions and then sit, right? Ask God questions and then sit. And, and, and what you'll find is this, soon you'll start to advance, right? And what what will happen in your prayer life is you, you'll move from more active to receptive, right? That's kind of the judge of how your prayer life is growing, if you can move from active to receptive, meaning that how much is it that you're driving it and how much is it that God is driving it? And if you're practicing this active listening, slowly the fruits of silence are going to start to grow in your life and you're going to become more comfortable with silence. Trust me, if you've never had silent prayer... It is awkward, okay? It is really awkward, okay? And so we want to just practice this active listening and start maybe with Scripture, reading a Scripture verse and asking God about it, right, his opinion. I'm going to add a fourth here, okay? I'm going to add a fourth here. One of the biggest keys uh, to me having real prayer was the fact that I said to God, I am angry about what you did. And I'll tell you why. It's, it's, very, it's very simple, right? It's, it's very easy for us to say, like, something went wrong in my life, and so I'm mad, but there must be something wrong with me, okay? And, and so we kind of, like, play this game with God. Like, we're mad at God, but we, don't, we would never dare say it, okay? Well, th that, just like it wouldn't be good in a normal human relationship, it would not be good, right? It would not be good in our relationship with God. We need to be sincere. 
And I think that that took me to a place of sincerity with God that I hadn't gotten to before. And so being sincere with God, saying, God, I'm upset about this. Where are you in this situation? Really can bring us deeper into that relationship. Just like, right, uh, I can't think of anything that my wife does that really bothers me, but I'm sure she could think of a million, okay? Uh, like, just like if I leave something out and my wife was bothered by it, but she never said anything to me, well, that shows something about the relationship, right? It shows something that, that, that she's either afraid or she doesn't have that communication with me. It's the same with God, right? God should be able to talk to us about the hard things. We should be able to talk to God about the hard things and be very, very deliberate about being sincere. Now, as I said before, when we deepen that well, we're able to access that deeper spring of living water, right? Uh, I don't know if anybody's read The Seven Story Mountain. It's by Thomas Merton, okay? And Thomas Merton, he's a a really good modern spiritual writer, okay? He's got some things that wouldn't recommend, but there's there's a lot of good stuff in Thomas Merton, okay? And he talks about, uh, in, in contemplative prayer, when we've been doing this for a long time, when we've gotten really good at sitting in, still, in stillness and silence and God is there, he talks about getting to that moment of creation where God is holding us in creation, right? Where he is creating us and just sitting in that moment of creation, right? And, and th this is where the well is deepest, right? When God, we are just putty in his hands. There's nothing we can do. We're just turned over completely to God and we're just saying, this time is yours, and just sitting in his presence, right? He is creator, so we're sitting in his presence. And when that well deepens, right, uh, we get more comfortable with asking God for things. I, I, this quote I read from a, a book by Father Jacques Philippe, I can't remember who said it, but it was about how priests need to be so comfortable asking God for things uh, actually, seminarians need to be so comfortable asking God for things and so confident that he will answer them before we let them be ordained, right? Because their job is to, to, to be holy and to let that holiness kind of flow through, right? And to have that kind of spiritual radiation, right? To, to affect other people around them. And that they should have this ability to beg God the way Moses did, the way Abraham did, uh, the way St. Faustina did, right? All these different people, holy people. You see, they have this method of begging God for people. And this is kind of the way it needs to be with prayer ministry, okay? We need to get really good at, at encountering God in our personal prayer so that we know what we're doing when we're praying with other people or for other people. I mean, it can, it can be really, really awkward, right? If, if we don't have a daily prayer life, when someone comes up and says, can you pray with me? Right? That's a very strange situation. Because how do you start that prayer? I haven't talked to you in a while, God, but remember I used to know you, like Dave Van Bickle, do you remember me? I'm going to pray for this person in front of you, right? It, that, that's a weird situation. So what we want to do is pray from a, play, a place of deep inner silence that extends from our personal life into our ministry. And so I'm going to give you kind of a few thoughts about ministry prayer, okay? Either intercession or actually praying with another person. Number one, we all have to get more comfortable with this, okay? We all have to get much more comfortable with this. And I'll tell you why, because as, as the world continues, right, just with the sexual culture and all this, people are wounded. And we have to get comfortable at being able to respond to the needs of the church, okay? I was at the grocery store not too long ago, and I heard these women, they had, they had to be... 95 years old talking to each other, okay, at, at, at the checkout line. I was eavesdropping on their conversation, and one of them said, well, I hurt my shoulder, and the other one said, oh, I've had that. You should go to my shoulder guy, okay? <laughs> Lord, please don't let me ever sh have a shoulder guy, right? But, but, but this is what the lady said, and all I could think that night was, like, imagine if someone at the, at the grocery store said, well, I'm really having problems in my marriage, and someone said, oh, you, you should go to this church. They'll pray for you, and and things will be better. Or if someone said, I'm really feeling uh, a lack of freedom in this area of my life, and someone said, oh, you know what St. Bonaventure's, they take care of that, right? Or someone said, I'm really struggling with this sins. Father so-and-so, he'll take care of that, you know? Everything's okay. Imagine if that's what it's like, if they said, oh, just find a Christian, 
They're going to pray with you. Everything's going to be taken care of, right? This is where we need to get to as a church, where we're ready to respond to real needs uh, of, of, our, of our brothers and sisters who are wounded, sometimes broken, sometimes needing physical healing, and we need to be able to do that. And so we need to deepen our prayer life. Now, here, here's a quick thought about that. I, I very much had the opinion for a long time, right, that what I did was do ministry, I, I, I ask God for something, and then I expect to be backed up by the Holy Spirit, right? Like as if like, you know, you know, you got like an older brother behind you and you're gonna like face off the bully, right? And, and for, for a, lot of, a long time, I thought prayer ministry was like that. Well, I'm gonna do it and then God's gonna back up that prayer. And, and, and I think in some cases, God honors when we, when we step out of the boat and do things like that and pray for people. But what really will deepen our ministry is if we realize that we're not in front, right? So we're not leading the Holy Spirit. Trust me, none of us are leading the Holy Spirit, okay? We're not, you know, leading that. What we need to do is recognize where the Holy Spirit is already moving and catch on to his coattails, okay? So what does this mean practically? What does this mean practically? It means we have to really put discernment back in our prayer ministry, okay? Because so often now uh, in the parish, someone will come in and say, could you pray for me for this? And we'll pray and pray and pray. And all of a sudden, I'll think, you know, it seems like God really wants to do this. Let's pray for that. And we start to pray for that. And, and sure enough, that is what God is doing in that person's life. And so, so very often, we try and, you know, kind of pound that square peg into a round hole when really God is already working. And we really need to just kind of catch on to the coattails, figure out where our part is, and, and, and be a part of that ministry, okay? I, most of this I learned from praying with Father Dave Pavanka, okay? Recently, praying a lot together. Father Dave almost always, if you've ever prayed with by him, he'll almost always, the first thing he'll say is, what are you feeling right now? What do you see right now? Are you getting any words right now? Not him, right? He's not saying, like, I have a word for you. I mean, he does. But that's not the first thing. He wants to know what you're doing. And, and really learning that and understanding that God is already working in the people's lives, we need to figure out how to help kind of release that. And so it really starts to help because we're not trying to lead someplace where God isn't already going. So we need to start to continue to do that. Number two, as far as just practical tips for prayer ministry, okay? Just so you know, every time I say a number, it just means I'm moving on. I never keep track of the number that I'm on. So it's, it's, I'll say number three, it usually means number six or something like that. Just means I'm moving on, so bear with me. That being said, number three, okay. We, we need to recognize now that there's more involved always, there's more involved always than what people come for prayer for or for what people are praying for, okay. So for instance, it used to be that someone would come up to the parish and they'd knock on my door and they'd say, Dave, this is what's happening. Can you pray with me right now? And I would immediately say, yep, let's pray right now. Let's do that, and we would go that. Now what I do is this. I sit down and say, well, tell me about what's going on in your life right now. And I kind of interview them, okay? Because we have to remember, right, that prayer ministry is ministry to a whole person, okay? So it's physical, emotional, spiritual, all combined into one. And so, so very often, right, uh, someone will say, I'm, I've just had this horrible anxiety. In fact, two weeks ago, a kid, uh, he, he couldn't finish his year at school, in high school, because uh, he just had this horrible anxiety, right, this horrible anxiety. So his parents bring him in. They say, Dave, will you pray for this kid? I said, of course. What's going on? He has anxiety. Can you pray for him to be freed from this anxiety? I say, sure, but let me talk to him for a little bit privately first, okay? Well, you know, we start to talk, and he says, well, it's just really stressful. My school is very stressful. And he said, you know, I'm just so tired all the time, and, and this is happening, and this is happening. I said, wait, what? why are you tired all the time? And he said, well, I don't know. I guess I just don't sleep enough. And I said, well, why aren't you sleeping enough? And he said, I don't know. I guess I'm just, I don't know. I guess I'm, I'm fooling around on the Internet at night, you know. And I said, well, what are you doing on the Internet at night? And he said, I don't know. And I said, well, tell me. You can tell me honestly. And I said, are you, are you looking at pornography on the Internet? And the kid said, yeah. And I said, how long has it been going on? And he said, well, it's been about six months since I've been able to ever say no. 
said, hey, I've been addicted for about six months. And, and I said, so what's happening? He said, well, I look at it all night and I don't know what to do. So right away, right, we could have prayed for a, a, an end to that anxiety, right? But just a little bit of an interview with this person was able to get to a deeper problem of where this is all coming from. And we were able to pray with this young man to be free from this addiction to pornography and, and give practical steps, right? Um, as a side note, right, if praying for people with addiction to pornography, you, it, it's a real chemical addiction, okay? It's not something that you can always just deal with in prayer. But we were able to pray that, you know, Satan's ties would be detached from his life, right, that they'd be broken, right, and, that, and this kid just experienced incredible freedom at the time of prayer. He just felt like he could go back and, and face the world, right? And, and so we kind of made some practical adjustments in his life. But the point is, is that if we had just come in and said, Lord, could you take away his anxiety? We'd be missing the bigger picture. And really, you know, recognizing that, like, you know what? God sent him in here for a reason. It's not his parents' initiative. He is here with me for a reason, just the way it is for our conference, right? We love to think that, oh, you know, I, I came to this conference because of this or because of this. In reality, we came here because God has drawn us here, right, as a lover. Number four, I think maybe, okay, number four. Next point, let's say that. Number four, <clears throat> at, at the deepest level, at the very deepest level, prayer ministry should be an expression of God's love for them, okay? It should be an expression of God's love for them. And so I would say, and, and there are people here who have thriving prayer ministries that could maybe disagree or agree when we have questions, but I would say that 90% of the people who come to be prayed with or the people who I encounter that need to be prayed with, that the core of their problem is that in some way, somehow, they do not believe that God loves them, okay? They do not believe that God loves them. And, 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 and this is the big time the case for the priests who I assist in deliverance and exorcism, okay? The very first thing Satan does to us is try to convince us that we are not loved by God, okay? And so there will be people who come and, and they, they have serious demonic issues, right? Serious demonic issues. And, and when we just explain to them, God loves you infinitely. God loves you infinitely and there's nothing you can do about it. No matter what, he loves you incredibly. You can't reject his love. You can't do any. All you have to do is accept it that God loves you, oftentimes that is, boom, right there. That's all you need. That's all they need to be healed. And so in every bit of prayer ministry, I might pray for someone to be healed of something physical, but I'm always praying for them to experience uh, the overwhelming love of Jesus Christ, right? An overwhelming love of God. And to have that knowledge that they're sons and daughters of God, right? I'd say 90 to 95% of the people who come, that is the biggest problem. And so we have to pray for that. Finally, always recognizing, right, that <clears throat> when, think of what Jesus did when he was on earth, okay, right, he healed, he taught, he delivered, he rose people from the dead, right, he raised people from the dead, he, he did all these different things, right, all of those should be present in our prayer ministry in some way, okay, and, and, and each time, right, that there's all these things affecting these people, and so when I pray with people, I always pray, God, please Equip them with everything they need to live your abundant life. Please heal them of everything that is not of you. Totally include from the top of their heads to the bottom of their feet. Send your Holy Spirit in there and heal them. And number three, please deliver them from anything that is not of you. And then I sit. And I discern and I pray. And I ask them what they're feeling. And I ask them what they're thinking. And if maybe we need to go back to one of those three points, we might go back to them. Well, I'm really new. I need some healing in this area or I really am experiencing some bondage in this area, or I really need, you know, I have this coming up and I really need help with this. We go back to these areas and we start to pray through them and we spend time. And, 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 and so often, right, those kind of cover a lot of bases with the people that we're praying with, okay? Finally, uh, I would say that our prayer ministry really needs to be a form of evangelization, a form of evangelization, okay? And, and, and it won't work if it's not. It won't work if it's not. Okay, I'm going to go back to the deliverance uh, example because it's so clear. Okay, someone who, who's demonized or someone who's struggling with, uh, you know, evil attachments, you could pray with them all day 
all day long, I promise you. You could pray with them all day long, years and years and years. But if they are not evangelized, it is not going to work, okay? It, it just won't, okay? It won't work. It might work for a period of time. You might think that it's working, but it won't work, okay? And so uh, it's awesome when people pray with people on the street, but they need knowledge too, right? Prayer and knowledge. And, and, and so we have to evangelize them very often before we can even make any headway in prayer because they need to know who's doing the work here, right? I mean, th think, of, think of that, right? If, if they don't know who Jesus Christ is, if they don't know who he is, then they think you're doing it, right? It's not going to work. It's not going to work that way very well, right? They need to know who Jesus Christ is and that Jesus is the one doing the work here. All you're doing is really just helping them to step out of the boat. So much of prayer ministry, we realize this, right, is just getting someone to step out of the boat. Is just getting someone to say, you know what, this is something physical I can do to go and ask. And to really step out of the boat and say, okay, I'm going to put, my, put myself on the line here and let God heal me. And, and we're just there, right? We're just there. Uh, and, and so much of ministry in general involves us being able to say, it's not me, right? I need to just step back and let God take over, right? That's, that's one of the most important parts to learn about ministry. And so almost always I end with either a recommitment prayer or a commitment prayer in prayer ministry. Because, uh, right, when Jesus heals, delivers, teaches, these are signs of the kingdom. And so we want to welcome them either deeper into the kingdom or welcome them into the kingdom, right, to, to kind of claim that kingdom that they're part of. And so almost always at the end of the prayer, we, we, we commit ourselves to the Lord again, over and over again. And so uh, if we can take these two together, right, if we, can, if we can have both prayer ministry and a very deep prayer life, we become a very effective person in the vineyard, okay? Uh, we're drawing strength from that deep well, and we're applying it to our, to our prayer ministry, okay? And remember in Scripture it says, the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. The prayers of a righteous man availeth much. Now, there have been times in my life when I was probably the greatest sinner on earth. And people have asked me to pray for them, and, and God has shown up. But what the difference is, is that when, when, when we're in sin and when we're not right with God, we have an awkwardness in our relationship with God. We're not able to listen. We're not able to really reflect on the keen movements of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we're not, we don't have that sensitivity to what God is doing in people's lives. And so the holier we are, the more, uh, the more uh, adopted to God we become, the more we become those sons and daughters, uh, the more we realize what we have. We know how to listen to our Father. We know how to listen to Jesus. We know how to listen to the Holy Spirit. And, and, and we have a real uh, intimacy there to the point where we're not saying, oh, great God of the universe who's out there and I know you've created everything, please heal this person. What we're saying is, Dad, could you come here and take care of this? Jesus, could you come here and take care of this? And there's a familiarity there uh, that, that might not exist if we, if we didn't really try and build this deep, deep prayer life. So the keys are to, to dig that well down deep, to dig that well down deep. And as you journey in your prayer life, remember, this is the last thing on earth Satan wants you to do, is to journey in your prayer life, okay? because you're journeying deep into the heart of Jesus, right? If you pray every day and your prayer moves from more active to receptive, you will be a saint, right? It's not like a 90% of the people who pray every day mentally are gonna be a saint. No, if you pray every day and you continue and your prayer moves from, from, from active to receptive, you are going to be a saint because what's gonna happen is you're gonna give more and more of your time over to God and he's gonna take it. He's gonna take it. Remember, he's a jealous God. He wants every bit of our hearts. And so we can continue, right, to where these prayer times, where we deepen those, extend into the rest of our life. To the point where, uh, like Paul says, to pray without ceasing. That eventually, it's so easy for us to access that inner room and that deep, deep well of living water that we can just do it instantaneously. There's a, a, 
super crazy priest that I used to work with, okay? And I, when I say crazy, I don't mean it like in an endearing way, like he was insane, okay? But, but he's a holy man, okay? But he, he, used, to say, he used to say to me all the time, right, uh, when, when I, I would be driving him around, and he'd be like, don't go into contemplative prayer while you're driving. And I'd be like, I don't know, it's not that easy for me, Father. I don't know what it's like for you, but, you know, it's not that easy, you know. But it was, for him, it was like he closed his eyes and he was in heaven. It's the way it was. And it's like, you know, he's so heavenly minded, he wasn't on earth anymore, right? So he was a little bit crazy. But, but that's where it needs to be, right? That, that when we close our eyes, when we invoke the Lord and the presence of God, that, that it's so fast for us to just draw deeply from that well because it's inside of us and it, and it just keeps bubbling up. 